This is Ms. Nelson. Today we are going to be learning about the periodic table and the properties of the elements. Our learning goals are, I can explain what the periodic table is, I can read the periodic table, I can explain how the periodic table is organized, and I can explain characteristics of the elements based on their location on the periodic table. What is the periodic table? The periodic table is a systematic way of organizing the elements. Elements are particles of matter which cannot be further broken down. Elements are atoms with a specific number of protons. All carbon atoms have six protons, all hydrogen have one proton, and all cobalt atoms have 27 protons. Let's look at one element on the periodic table. Lithium, the three is the atomic number. The Li is the atomic symbol. Let's be honest, sometimes it's a lot easier to write one or two letters than it is to write out an entire word. The element name is included. And the atomic mass unit, or AMU. AMU stands for, again, atomic mass unit. The atomic number is equal to the number of protons. It also equals a neutral atom's number of electrons. When the atoms react with other atoms, the number of electrons can change. The atomic mass unit, AMU, is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, with a little bit of averaging thrown in there, because statistically there's a higher proportion of certain elements with a certain number of protons, with a certain number of neutrons, than there are of others. Hydrogen has one proton, it has one electron, and for the most part it has no neutrons. So it has an atomic mass of 1.008. That 0 0.008 is because a very small percentage of the atoms have neutrons, which changes the mass. It can get a lot more precise and complicated. For now, this is all you need to know. So using the atomic number and the atomic mass, let's figure out how many neutrons an atom has. We take the atomic number, so 6.941 minus the atomic number 3, and that tells us that there are 3.941 neutrons. Well, you can't have 0 0.941 neutrons, so we round it to our nearest whole number, which is 4. People have been trying to organize the elements for centuries. Around 330 BCE, Aristotle proposed that everything was made of a mixture of four things. Many years later, Plato named them elements. They were earth, water, air, and fire. Prior to 1750, only 16 elements were known. Some of these elements included were phosphorus, mercury, zinc, sulfur, and gold. Antoine Lavoisier published a list of elements in what is considered the first chemistry textbook. He listed substances that he did not believe could be further broken down. He included light and caloric, which he thought were physical substances. Antoine categorized the elements as metals, nonmetals, or gases. He included 33 elements in his list. Few elements appear pure in nature. Examples include gold, silver, copper, sulfur, and platinum. Gold panning is a thing because you can separate pure gold flakes and nuggets from the surrounding sediment. Without this property, the gold rushes would never have happened. Some elements, such as carbon and mercury, can easily be extracted. Carbon can be isolated by making charcoal. Mercury can be extracted by heating cinnabar rock. Dmitry Mendeleev was the first scientist to create a periodic table similar to the modern table. Dmitry was a Russian scientist. He was the first person to arrange the elements with two separate ideas. The first was to arrange them by their reactivity and their characteristics. The other thing was he left blanks for as yet undiscovered elements, which he named and predicted their properties. 
their names haven't stayed because they were really things like pre-sulfur and pre-tin. But those properties have proven correct. Dimitri's table was so accurate that we have used it with few modifications since its creation. Remember, the periodic table is a systematic way of organizing the elements. The periodic table is sorted into columns or groups, which go up and down, or rows or periods, which go side to side. Similarly behaving elements are located in the same group, so in the same column. All elements in a group have similar properties. This allowed Dimitri to predict properties of undiscovered elements. Next, we are going to be learning about the different groups on the periodic table. The first group we are going to be learning about is the alkali metals. The alkali metals are located in the first column of the periodic table. The alkali metals include lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. They react with oxygen. Because of this, they are all stored in oxygen-free environments. Sodium is almost always stored under some sort of oil, and francium, cesium, and rubidium are usually stored in airtight vials. They are all very soft. They can easily be cut with a butter knife. They are malleable and ductile. Malleable means it can be hammered or pressed into thin sheets. Ductile means that it can be stretched or drawn into wires. The alkali metals react violently with water. When compounds containing these elements are burned, they produce colored flames. This is how the colors in fireworks are produced. Sodium-containing compounds produce a yellow-orange flame. Lithium produces a crimson flame. The alkali metals have one valence electron. Valence electrons are outermost electrons. They are what reacts during a chemical reaction. The alkali metals are so reactive, they only appear in nature bonded to other elements. So, they appear as compounds. Next, we are going to be learning about the alkali earth metals. The alkaline earth metals are located in the second column of the periodic table. The alkaline earth metals include beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and radium. The alkaline earth metals are most abundant in the earth's crust. They are relatively soft, but not as soft as the alkaline metals. They can't all be cut with a butter knife. They react with water, but again, less violently than the alkaline metals whereas sodium will react explosively when it's put in water. Magnesium and calcium will produce bubbles when they're put in water. Because the alkaline earth metals are so reactive, they do not appear pure in nature. These metals are shiny, silver-white metals. They have two valence electrons. Next, we are going to be learning about the transition metals. The transition metals are located in column 3 through column 12. They are all metals and make up the majority of the table. They all have similar characteristics. All transition metals are shiny, ductile, and malleable. They all conduct heat and electricity. The electrons in metals flow easily and are shared between all metal atoms. The transition metals have metallic bonds, meaning that they literally just share their electrons evenly. So again, remember that the electrons move easily along metal this is why houses are wired with copper. Electricity moves easily along copper. The number of valence electrons varies by element and even by situation. Copper can have two or three valence electrons. Next, we will be learning about the lanthanides. It may seem like the lanthanides are located with the transition metals. If we were to stick the lanthanides and actinides on the main body of the periodic table, we would need to move the transition metals over. This would make the periodic table too wide to fit on a single page. By placing the lanthanides below the periodic table, the entire table fits on one page. The lanthanide series has 15 elements, including lanthanum, neodymium, and europium. The lanthanides are relatively soft. They are silvery white color. They oxidize or react quickly when exposed to oxygen. The lanthanides dissolve easily in acid. They also react with halogens when heated. The lanthanides are highly reactive and only appear bonded with other elements. Next, we are going to be learning about the actinoids. Like the lanthanides, they are traditionally located below or beside the periodic table. The actinide series 
is named for the first metal in the series, actinium. The actinoids include 15 elements between number 89 and 103. Some elements in this series are uranium, californium, and americum. All the actinoids are radioactive. They also tarnish easily in air. The actinoids are very dense. They are highly reactive and can even spontaneously combust. The actinoids were discovered fairly recently. Some of the actinoids have only been man-made. They do not appear in nature at all. Next, we are going to be learning about the nonmetals. The nonmetals are a group of seven atoms located on the upper right hand of the periodic table. They look a little like an upside down staircase. The nonmetals include hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, oxygen, sulfur, and selenium. Notice that hydrogen is located above the alkali metals, but it is still a nonmetal. The nonmetals are dull. They do not conduct electricity or heat. In fact, the nonmetals are fantastic insulators. The nonmetals are brittle. They break easily. The nonmetals are not malleable. They also have low densities and relatively low melting points. The nonmetals gain and steal electrons easily. Next, we are going to be learning about the poor metals or the post transition metals. These metals are sometimes considered part of the transition metals. It really depends what literature you read and who you are talking to. These metals are located under the metalloids. They are called post transition because they are after the transition metals. They share characteristics with the transition metals. They are shiny, dense, malleable, and ductile. These metals tend to steal electrons rather than share them evenly. Sometimes group 11 and 12 are considered part of the post-transition metals. The poor metals or post-transition metals include aluminum, gallium, indium, thallium, tin, lead, and bismuth. It is acceptable in this class to call and consider them transition metals. Next, we are going to be learning about the metalloids. The metalloids have properties of both metals and non-metals. They are located like a staircase from column 13 through column 16. Boron, silicon, geranium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium, and polonium are all metalloids. Some of the metalloids are semiconductors. That means that they conduct electricity in certain circumstances. Silicon may be the most famous example of a semiconductor. Without silicon and its properties, we would not have computers, or at least computers like the one you are using now. Like the nonmetals, metalloids are brittle. Some metalloids are shiny. Next, we are going to be learning about the halogens. The halogens are located in column 17 of the periodic table. This group is extremely reactive. In fact, the reactivity of the group increases as you go up the column. Fluorine is the first element of the halogens, and it is the most reactive. In fact, fluorine is so reactive that it will actually eat glass. The halogens include fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, astatine, and element 117. The halogens are unique. The first two elements, fluorine and chlorine, are gases. Next is bromine, which is a liquid. Finally, iodine and the rest of the elements are solids at room temperature. Because these elements are so reactive, they only appear bonded to other elements in nature. The halogens are also one of the nastiest and most dangerous. In fact, chlorine gas was one of the gases used to kill soldiers in World War I. All the halogens are nonmetals. They have seven valence electrons. They usually steal electrons from other atoms. The final group of elements is the noble gases. The noble gases are extremely unreactive. They were originally called inert gases because they are so unreactive. That was until a scientist discovered that fluorine can actually react with xenon. The noble gases are located in column 18. The noble gases are helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, and as yet unnamed element 118. These elements are all gases. Helium has two valence electrons. The rest have eight valence electrons. Because they have two or eight valence electrons, they are happy and unreactive. All naturally occurring elements have been discovered. That doesn't mean that all possible elements have been discovered. New elements can be created in special settings inside a laboratory. Scientists take an element with a relatively high atomic number and bombard it with radiation. Sometimes the atoms will gain protons from the radiation and the atomic mass will increase. 
If the number of protons in the atomic mass increases enough, a new element is made. Remember, atoms are defined by their number of protons. For example, helium has two protons, and radon always has 86 protons. All new elements must be confirmed by two independent laboratories before they are considered a real element. As of 2015, the periodic table is full. New elements may be discovered in the future. Let's review. The periodic table is a systematic way of organizing all 118 elements. As more elements are discovered, they can easily be added to the periodic table. Dmitry Mendeleev created the original version of the periodic table we use today. It has survived with very few modifications. The periodic table is organized into groups or columns and rows or periods. Similarly behaving elements are grouped into columns together. The groups on the periodic table include the alkali metals, the alkaline earth metals, the lanthanides, the actinides, the transition metals, and the post-transition metals. The periodic table also includes the nonmetals, metalloids, halogens, and the noble gases. Each group has unique characteristics. For example, the alkali metals react violently with water, and the actinides are all radioactive.